So in this video, we're going to talk about neural networks. And neural networks have become a really exciting topic in machine learning. Um, and it's one of these things that it turns out is actually very old and is a very old idea um, and has become something that people have figured out how to make work really well in real data settings. In these lectures, we're mostly going to spend our time looking at feed forward neural networks. And the plan is for this video to just do a very high level overview. I'm going to show you, I'm going to explain to you what it is because it, it sounds very exotic and it is motivated by, you know, actual biological neural networks. But, um, but the actual math is very, very much related to the things that we've seen so far. So the plan for this video is to go over the idea of logistic regression and perceptron as types of neural networks. In fact, they're usually considered the simplest type of neural network you could have. Then we'll look at something called the multi-layered perceptron, which is the first step toward the deep types of neural networks that, that have become really popular lately. Um, and then I'll show you an example of uh, some of the possible outputs that, that you can get, or some of the types of functions you can model with these multi-layered perceptrons. And you'll see examples of how the multi-layeredness and the fact that we have information passing from the input to the, of the function through different paths to the output will lead to the ability to represent nonlinear decision boundaries. And I won't go too deep into the math here. Uh, I'll show you essentially how the function is computed. And then in later lectures, we'll talk about how we do, learn, how we do learning or we'll be more precise about how we do learning anyway. So before we get into those uh, topics, I'll start by discussing where this whole thing comes from. So of course you can guess from the name of these types of models that these are models that are motivated by actual biological neural networks. And in biological neural networks, the, the neurons or the brain cells, uh, they have the ability to send signals to other other connected neurons. And basically once there's enough signal coming in from the, the uh, connected neurons, they can cause each other to fire. So each, neur each neuron has a bunch of, you can think of it as incoming signals, and if enough of those signals are activated, then the neuron itself will start activating and then send signals out to whatever it's connected to. And neurons are connected in a complex network that, you know, gives rise to all of our human intelligence and, and all animal, t animal intelligence that have similar nervous systems. So we can sort of imagine that the models that we've looked at so far kind of do something like this already. And we can think about, you know, the slide that I showed you from a couple lectures ago on logistic regression, where we have, you know, we have a, a vector of inputs. The vector of inputs is multiplied by some weights. And if that score, the score function, you know, inside that exponent is big enough, then we are going to predict positive and otherwise it's negative. And, and you can think of predicting positive in this situation or, or having a high score you know, coming out of that, that logistic function as a neuron activating. And in the last video, I showed you this picture of a graphical representation of the perceptron, which is the, basically the same idea, right, where you have these inputs coming in, the x's are the inputs, they are, uh, you know, they have some value, and if they add up you know, through the weights, if they add up to a big enough number, then your Y prediction is positive, otherwise it's negative. So this is a single layer neural network um, in the sense that there's just the inputs and the inputs that direct, directly decide, determine whether the output neuron is gonna fire. Right? So you can think of the inputs as something like, like the receptors in our, in our retinas that just detect uh, you know the brightness of some region in our in our field of vision, and the output could be, you know, something as simple as is the is the scene really bright, and that's something you can model with just a single layer, where all we're doing is quickly deciding is there enough brightness in the scene that we want to do something like contract our pupils or uh, or or squint our eyes to avoid having too much light flood our, our visual cortex. So of course. When we think about the human brain, 
or any animal brain, it's much more complex than that. It's not just inputs to outputs. It's actually something closer to, you know, a, a, the input goes into some other neuron that decides whether to fire, and then that neuron passes on to other ne neurons, and there's layers and layers and layers until finally you get to some point where you're making some decision about whether to run away from, you know, a predator or 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 chase some prey or something. So. So that suggests that we should want to consider neural networks or artificial com computational neural networks that have many layers, which gets us to the multilayered perceptron idea. And in the multilayered perceptron, it, still are, it starts with the same building block, the same idea of this linear classifier. Um, and essentially, it's going to be a linear classifier with a squashing function on top of it. And I'll, I'll show you an, an example of this that in, in the actual mathematical form um, later on. But basically, you get all these inputs, and you, you use those inputs to decide whether to activate this neuron. And now we're going to call this neuron H1. And then there's many, many other H's. So there's H1 and H2 in this case, uh, both of which are essentially, or in this case, in this picture, both of these are like other perceptrons. There's two perceptrons here, or there's, you could also say there's two forms of logistic regression here that predict H values. And then from the H values, there's yet another layer that finally predicts the output. So this is a two-layer neural network, a two-layer per perceptron. And what the layers are is that they, the first very top layer, sort of just, it's not a real layer at all. It's the real data. These are the observations. These come in from the, re the real world or from your data. And then there's this middle layer, which is something that it, we like to think that, that these types of models are able to use these middle layers to represent something, to, to, to represent the real data in a way that's semantically meaningful. And then finally, using that semantically meaningful representation, we can then do prediction in, in, in a way that is hopefully more nuanced and more accurate than directly going from raw data to prediction. So an example of this could be something like in a computer vision application, you have pixel values as the raw data. Uh, and then maybe maybe the representation layer could represent shapes, could somehow identify whether some some things are are different, you know, have different shape-like attributes. Uh, and then finally, the output the output may be whether or not a group of pixels is actually a face or is actually an image of a face, right? So the shapes could represent something like is it a round shape? Is there something round in the image? Or is there, are there lots of shadows? Are the shadows around the middle where the eye the eyes tend to be? So that's a very you know abstract kind of you know cartoony picture of what a multilayered perceptron would look like. But then if we want to look closer at how the these things are actually written down in mathematical form, uh, each, like I said, each of these hidden layers is like a logistic regression. It's basically a, a perceptron right, in the mid in the in the middle where we apply some some squashing function to it and. One of the classical squashing functions is the logistic function, but there are other there are other functions, and we, we can talk about those later. So this inner term is just uh, you know it's just a linear operation on the input data, and like I said, at the same time we have a another linear uh, operator on the data that that that's a to could be a totally different vector. It's essentially a totally different classifier. Um, that, that determines this other hidden unit. And then finally, the last piece, you can, you can combine those two hidden units to form, you can think of it as, as another input. It's now the input for the second layer, which is gonna get the, um, you know, the H vector as its input and apply some W, uh, some weight vector to that W. And I index these, I, I, uh, you know, kind of, uh, in a way that that should indicate what layer you're in and which uh, which in which unit you are in that layer. So you know W11 means that you're in the first layer, uh, and it's it's H1. It's a hidden. It's the first unit of the first layer. And W12 is the uh, first layer and the second hidden unit. And the last one is the second. You know W21 is the second layer and the first unit. And there's only one unit. And and written written out in in a nested function format, the the actual you know probability function that we would be outputting is something like this, where we have you know a a a sigmoid or a logistic of a linear function of a logistic and another logistic.
right? So there's two logistics on the inside and it's all nested within an outer logistic. So that's what the output looks like. And, um, you know, what does this buy us? It's not really obvious, you know, that this is going to buy us anything because, you know, we were already able to do logistic regression with one layer. Um, you know, what do we get when we complicate things by adding these different layers? So let's look at some pictures I plotted in MATLAB. So the first thing is, this is just a single layered uh, logistic regression. So you can think of it as a, a single layered neural network with a logistic squashing function. And we get decision surfaces like this, which is what we should expect, where the red, you know, the more red you are, the more likely you are to be one. And the, the more blue you are, the more likely you are to be zero or, or minus one, depending on what, how you represent it. And the decision surface where things go from point under 0.5 to above 0.5 is just a line right in the middle of the blue and red. And here's another example of just another random weight vector. So, so this is what we expect, right, is a linear classifier. But now if we add another layer, then we get, you know, a two layer unit. And let's say in, in, in the hidden, in the second layer or the middle layer, we have uh, two hidden units. So if we add that in and we and I initialize weights randomly, and just these are just random models, we get pictures that look like this, which, you know, aside from being very pretty, obviously also show some curviness that we weren't able to capture with just a, a linear model. And here's another example. So I can throw out a few more examples just to, so you can see some, um, you know, not, to satisfy your curiosity, because once, once I drew this one, I was very curious myself. So here's another example where we have still two layers, but now we have more hidden units. And it looks kind of similar. It's not clear, it's, it's not obvious to me that this is necessarily a more, a richer function class. Although I think intuitively, if I'm thinking about the math, it's gotta be richer, but you can see it's, you know, a little bit more curvy and kind of has a more exotic shape. Uh, similarly, here's a, one where we have uh, 10 hidden units in that one hidden layer. And then lastly, the other question is, you know, what happens if we have more hidden layers? So here's some other examples. So we have, if we have 10 layers and we have five hidden units per layer, um, you know, here's a picture that you can get. Also very interesting decision surface here. And then uh, here's another example with four layers and 10 hidden units per layer. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't take too much away from these plots because I'm just, I'm just showing random weight neural networks. But I, I think the, the general trend is that there's now, with the ability to add more layers and add more hidden units, we can now model richer function classes. So how do we train these things? I'll, and I'll just give you the high level idea. So we do something that's this very famous algorithm called back propagation. And it's basically um, a dynamic programming approach to computing chain rule derivatives. But, uh, but it, it, it's, it's quite elegant. So, so what you do is you first compute the, the, all the hidden unit activations. So this is the forward propagation part of the algorithm where you just compute essentially the way we drew it on the, on the other slide where we start from the top, we start from the inputs, compute all the hidden layers in the first layer, then go to the next layer and go to the next layer and eventually get to the last output. Okay, and once you've done that, then you compute the gradient at the output layer. It turns out that's pretty easy because you can just compute it uh, relative to the the input of the output layer, which was the last hidden layer. Okay, and then that is the error. We can call that the error. Then we're, we're gonna, what we do, what, what's so brilliant is that if you study the chain rule closely, which we will in the next uh, lecture, you can just propagate the error back one layer at a time by, by essentially multiplying that, that uh, the error from the, the next layer um, by the weights, by the weights that distribute the decision from the hidden unit values to the next the next layer, so we can we can work that backwards and propagate the error back, which allows us to compute the gradient for every single weight in the network. Right? And there were lots of weights. There was for for every single hidden unit, you have a set of weights. Um, so if you have lots of layers and lots of hidden units, that's a lot of weights. So what this is, like I said, is is actually an instance of chain rule via dynamic programming, you know, which is just a, a, a jargon term from computer science or from classical computer science to describe storing the outputs of functions so you can compute recursions faster. So in other words, we'll, have, we'll derive a recursive definition of 
the gradients or recursive formula for the gradients. And because we compute forward propagation, we can store some of the values we're going to, we're going to need during that recursive computation. Okay, and we'll get into that in the next lecture or so.